Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mother Days podcast. I am your host, Sarah Wright Olson. And I am Teresa Palmer. What's up, guys? What's up, Daisy? It's the new year. Ah, uh, this is so great. We have been getting so many messages from you guys about. Um, lots of different things. And we wanted to jump into the new year and tackle some of these um, wonderful topics. And so today we want to cover a little bit of like transition with um, co-sleeping or sleeping or cre- – wait, I've done it so many different ways that um, we have a lot to, to cover. <laughs> and then oh also also just going from one to two kids. Someone was asking about that too, so I'll read some of these messages. Mm, but, I can't wait um, to talk about that. So – Let's jump in and talk about um, let's talk about transitioning from one to two kids. I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, because also the bed stuff mm. comes up with that anyway. It totally does. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Well, do you know what's so funny? I don't know if this happened to you, but everyone was like, when I was first pregnant, people sent me a list of must haves. Like you got to buy this stroller, and yeah. you got to get this crib, and yep. this is a really cute thing, and. A, girl, a very good girlfriend of mine, um, by the time this comes out, she's probably told people she's pregnant. But just in case, uh, <laughs> you know who she is. I know who she is. Anyway, one of my best friends is pregnant for the first time. Mm. And she was like, oh, my God, I am blowing my bank buying all yeah. the things. And she's 12 weeks pregnant right now. <laughs> and she's like, holy shit, I'm going broke already. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But hang on a second. Like, I feel like we need to release our actual must-haves of what people should buy when they're pregnant because someone was like this is the crib you're gonna get I'm like cool Mm. I went and bought the crib I think my kids over the years because I kept the same (laughs) one probably napped in it four times that's it no one ever slept in it it ended up being in storage for us as like a (laughs) holder of other boxes (laughs) until eventually I was like wait I really want someone to use this because it's such a beautiful crib that I want to give it away to Goodwill or um, another like secondhand store so that someone will get usage out of it and really use it. But in my experience, I never used a crib or a cot, as we say in Australia. And when I got pregnant with my second kid, Bodhi was still co-sleeping and um, it was just me and my big belly and Bodie in the middle and Mark. And we were just snug as a bug in a rug. And in fact, I noticed a couple of comments, Sarah, on your setup because people were like, woo, she's like room yes. sharing because you've got a bed next yep. to your king bed. Yes. That Who sleeps on that bed? Is that Esme? Okay, that's or Esme. Or is it winter? It's oh. Esme. And it used to be... It used to be why it would sometimes come in and out. And during the pandemic, we had this um, really interesting time where, like, I think because the world was a little shaky all around us and nobody really knew what was going on and we were all just kind of locked down, like right at the very beginning of the pandemic, everybody wanted to sleep in our bedroom. So it was Mm -hmm. just like the world was a little shaky And so Wyatt and Ezzy slept in our bedroom and I was pregnant and we all just slept in the same room. And a lot of places that we go, we all sleep in the same room. We have a very um, like modest size home. It's like 1900 square feet and there's three bedrooms. Um, But Wyatt and Esme share one bedroom and then we have a guest room. Um, So they don't sleep. I mean, Wyatt sleeps in that bedroom now. Esme sleeps next to me. The baby sleeps in bed with us. Um, And sometimes Eric sleeps on the trundle bed in Wyatt's room. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. So sweet. So, and my really good friend, uh, Beyonce, says that we are the Crudes family. Like, we're a sleep pile. (laughs) And she's so right because um, I just love a sleep pile. And um, so, yeah, so that's the picture because people ask about it all the time. And I even had a friend writing me the other day who, like, has um, a brand 
brand new baby and she's talking about like co-sleeping and worrying about baby rolling out of bed and like all of that stuff. And so she's like, what is this bed next year? Like, where do I buy this bed? And I'm like, it's a mattress on the floor. <laughs> and it's, um, I buy Naturepedic. And I buy yes. Naturepedic because it's organic and um, they're super uh, amazing about like, you know, what goes into a mattress. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you've never looked into what goes into a mattress, there's so many chemicals involved. And this Naturepedic is like organic cotton. They're handmade. They're memory just like, farm. Um, mo no, they're not memory foam. Really? Yeah, no. Um, they have like there. You can get ones that have like the silicone topper, um, but they're they even have like a wool, like an all wool topper that you can put on that regulates temperature. Like they're oh, amazing. Wow. Yeah, Naturepedic. So wow. um, I feel like so you've talked to me about them before. I love them because I love that their uh, mattresses are all handmade in this um, warehouse on the East Coast. And they're like, even the coils that have organic cotton wrapped around. So for some of the beds, there's coils. They're like hand done. Like oh everything goodness. is. I know. It's amazing. Wow. Um, so their uh, mattress is what's on the floor over here. And it's a kid's like toddler, not toddler. Um, what's it called? A twin size? Yeah, a twin yeah, size. It's like twin. the small one. Yeah. Um, is next to my bed and I just put like cozy, you know, bedding on it. And uh, and then my bed is right next to it. And I have a sort of platform bed, so it's like lower to the ground. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, that's my setup. So Tess, keep going. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. Um, so we were you did ask me about transitioning from one to two, and then maybe yes. we can dive back into sleeping and sort of our experience with that a little bit more yeah. um, because I know people always ask about that and they have a lot of worries surrounding sleeping. Oh, will they ever get out of the bed? Yes, they yeah. do. Mine definitely got out of the bed. Yeah. Um, but it's also a matter of personal choice, of course. Totally. So um, transition <laughs> from one to two babies, I would say that was maybe my – Mo I don't want to use the word challenging because I was all about having a second baby because I had um, secondary infertility. So it was, it took me a while to get pregnant for the second time. So even I had this moment of surrender and I've talked about this before. I surrendered um, my obsessiveness surrounding getting pregnant for the second time with um, my next baby because it just was affecting my life in such a negative way. I wasn't able to be present. I was living in these two week increments in my life, like oh. two weeks until I could try for a baby again, two weeks until I could test to see if I was pregnant. Oh no, I'm not pregnant. Two weeks until I can try again. So it was like these little two week periods in my life that just felt really challenging. So I surrendered, ended up getting pregnant with Forrest. And then he was born when Bodhi was two years and nine and a half months to be exact, which is just, it turned out to be such an amazing age gap because um, I potty trained uh, Bodhi at 21 months, night and day. So he was done through the night and through the day. So I was like, yay, I didn't have any diapers. Um, he, you know, he was speaking really well and he was largely an independent kind of dude. Um, he's a little bit different to when Forrest came out, my second baby, and was so independent. Um, Forrest still really, I mean, Bodhi still really wanted a lot of mum engagement and it was so fun. But I have to say there's something that a lot of people don't often talk about, but there's this grieving process, I think, towards the end of your pregnancy with your second child where you start to realize that, oh my gosh, this dynamic shift is about to change. It was just yeah. me and my first. And all of a sudden it happens to so many people where yeah. in those last few weeks of pregnancy, you realize like everything's going to change and change is scary. And I started feeling so guilty about yeah. how Bodhi wouldn't be the only. Um, and the only way I could reframe that was thinking, what a divine gift I'm giving him in gifting him with this sibling, with this playmate, with this built-in buddy for the rest of his life. Um, should we be so blessed that the children get to live side by side for many, 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 many years? Like I didn't experience that. I was an only child 
and um, I had older half siblings who were 10 and 12 years older than me and they were just on my dad's side. So I sort of lived with them a little bit, but it was quite a different experience and I longed for it all the time. And in fact, I remind my kids if they're ever like having big feelings towards each other or if, you know, the words come out like, I hate you. Um, yeah. I always say like, guys, I want to remind you, your yeah. mom wanted siblings so much. It was my biggest dream in life was to have siblings. And I would beg my mom day and day, out, please, mom, please, mom, please, mom. And my mom was a single mother and she didn't have a partner. And so that was just wasn't in the cards for us. Um, and they always... It really helps them stop and feel so grateful that they have each other. And even through the pandemic, having each other and um, the way we travel as a family, like they've just got these built-in playmates, but still knowing that this was in their future in my mind, like, all right, these kids are going to have a bunch of siblings. It's going to be amazing. I was wrapped with guilt moving from one baby to the second. Um, I felt like when Forrest came, we had such a blissful first few months because we were talking to Bodhi so much about having a new sibling and we bought Bodhi a present from the baby when the baby arrived. <laughs> we were like, Forrest gifted you this thing and it was this particular like garage with cars that I knew yeah. Bodhi really, really wanted. So We did that too. <laughs> yeah, it's a great idea and I read about it and I was like, okay, this is a good way to prep that next child. And then also I would refer to the baby as what do you think your baby needs? What do you think he's asking for? And Brody would be like, he wants boobies. Or like, he wants um his how nappy old changed. Was, how old was Bodhi? Two years, nine months. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and I also, this is another thing, and this isn't typical, but if you're in the camp of you feel fine breastfeeding through your pregnancy, fantastic. I felt, I yeah. think for us a really big part of helping sort of massage the idea of bringing in a new baby into our family was um, Bodhi continued breastfeeding through the pregnancy and then we tanned and breastfed. So the first time he met Forrest, um, the two of them were breastfeeding together and I, and Bodhi was just staring at him and touching his little skin. And um, a lot of the wording I think is very important, like your baby and folding him into it and not separating Bodhi from the things I was doing with the baby. Like, oh, I'm picking him up now and um, should we give him a bath? And uh, we would often like me and Bodhi would jump in the bath and we'd have the baby in there and I'd let um, Bodhi gently <laughs> wash the baby and be involved in the care so he felt a sense of responsibility. And I will say that that helped the transition so much. I will say that for me, the transition from one to two kids, that was of all my transitions, um, one to two kids, two to three kids, three to four kids, I found that that one was more challenging because Bodhi still wanted me as a playmate mm -hmm. and I had a new baby. So I would, I didn't do a lot of the self-care that I look back on and I was just, I was a little bit younger and I was just so focused on this new baby and focused on Bodhi that I didn't cultivate enough self-care. So I was very tired and I would just have the baby in a sling so I could be hands-free. I was baby wearing and then I could run after Bodhi. Um, and I would say that I just didn't take that period of time slowly enough uh, to really like replenish my body and nurture myself and do the first 40 days, which we talk about a lot. Um, and I've learned since then that the postpartum period should be slow going and easy and I'm just like taking it not just e it's not easy obviously it's not easy but taking it easy it's taking yourself. it slow taking it yes being gentle and you're trying to think of like how can I make my space and everything as like like kind of slow and gentle and as like nurtured and at home as possible mm -hmm. in the first 40 days so that your body has time to heal so that you're not 
racing out the door so that you're just as much as you can, just maybe walking from the bedroom to the kitchen, to the bathroom, to the, you know, and then just keeping your space small if possible. Yeah. Like that. And a lot of people won't do that. And I think I sort of got, I was so excited to have two children. I was immediately (laughs) three days after birth and I had the most magical birth with Forrest. So I I felt really good three days. Like I felt really good a few hours postpartum with Forrest because it was my dream, dream birth. But still three days postpartum, I have the baby in a sling. I'm at Bodhi's school um for his like concert and everyone's like oh my god how old's the baby thinking that I'm gonna say like six weeks old I was like three days old everyone's like you need to go home (laughs) what are you why are you here (laughs) what are you doing I was like I'm just trying to keep everything normal for Bodhi and I was so Uh, I just wanted everything to feel like his life didn't get interrupted but it's okay if their life does get interrupted and like dad's doing school pickups and dad's at the concert, yeah. that is okay. And they, I think it comes down to like, fine. it's more about us yes. in that time. And you the know? guilt. Like, and I was like, yeah, oh my the God. Guilt. I just like, I want to show up the way that I was showing up for yes. him, even if I have a three day old baby. Um, exactly. And that just like, it also comes with experience. And now I've had more years in parenting and I'm like, oh, I wouldn't do that now. I'd be like, hey, Mark, like go take a video, like (laughs) FaceTime me from from the concert. I want to see it, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Hillary, we were talking to Hillary Duff um, in her episode and she said this amazing thing about how like, you know, over the 10 years that she's been a parent, but like as you have more children, like you just find your way back to yourself quicker. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but like, yes, like I agree with that. It's like- as you have more, it's just also with experience. So if you had, so if you had like, you know, advice to give to a mother that's asking, you know, this transition from one to two kids, like your advice then would be what? Um, Yeah, I would say go gentle on yourself Mm -hmm. and slow. And I, I think and know like, that the guilt is normal. Yes, the guilt is so it's normal. normal. If you're and feeling I always, that, yes, that's normal. And it's everyone yeah. else is in the same boat. And I think letting go of expectations mm-hmm. is so huge. I mean, I think in life in general, letting go of expectations is such a gift. I don't know if you've ever yeah. read the book, The Four Agreements, but that's one of the the agreements in life. It's like, mm. just let go of expectations. Yeah. And for me, um, I really feel like I've done postpartum well sometimes and other times I'm like, oh, I just rushed into it. I was so excited to be out in the world with my mm-hmm. new babies and doing things and like, whoa, I'm bouncing back and woo. I'm just like, it's not like I didn't yeah. even really, it's not so I had a baby. Look at me. I'm like doing the routines and I'm back in it. And it wasn't really for show. It was more for myself to be like, look what I can conquer. Look what I can yeah. accomplish. But yeah. I can um, say now that, those days went by so fast because I jam packed them with things. Um, and I don't know whether it, I was showing up for Bodhi and it was a positive thing for him. Maybe it was that I was just straight back into the way that things were, but um, I've also done postpartum different where I've like laid in bed more and just been with the baby. Like with Prairie, I did so much of that, like lying in bed and having the kids come to me and explaining like, oh, mommy's resting and mommy's replenishing her stores and her body. And that's such a gift to show yeah. kids that like this is a really beautiful, sacred, like cocoon time yes. with mother and baby and learning to be in a new family. And we're honoring rest too like honoring rest absolutely. it's just something that I don't you know I don't I don't know that I ever heard anybody say that in my life as a kid or as an adult like until I met Sonia my you know doula bestie nanny and she said you know we really need to honor rest and mm. she's right like honoring the time to rest to heal to understand that like that's your body's working so hard to replenish everything to restore that you're 
If you're breastfeeding. You've, you know, you've spent nine months pregnant. Now your body's going, I'm not pregnant anymore. So I have to put all the organs back to where they go. And I got to like, you know, we got to fold the muscles back in mm -hmm. and we got to make milk. So we have to like, you know, feed a baby mm -hmm. and, you know, it's amazing, but there's so much that goes into it. And we just think like yeah. society tells us like, okay, now I have to look back like a supermodel. Now I got to go it's zip ridiculous. up my jeans. Like I got to go do this, do that. Like that. No, that is not what you have to do. <laughs> I remember this article came out in the daily mail, um, commenting on my postpartum body, Oh my gosh. Uh, and it was, I was like maybe six weeks postpartum and there was a photo of um, that Mark and I took on a hike and they like took it off my Instagram, made a uh, an article about it. And then they were being like, what an unrealistic look at what a postpartum body is. It's like, oh my goodness. My <laughs> husband took a photo of me on a hike and you guys are objectifying me. Somehow talking about my physical body in this article in a negative way saying like, oh, she's too thin or she's too. And then they did a backup article a week later where a paparazzi had taken photos of me and they were like, phew, thank God we're seeing a much more realistic version of Teresa's body. I was wearing um, like you could see my stomach rolls and stuff because I had just had a baby. Um, and then it was like this crazy like verses thing yeah. and I always talk about how much I hate like verses. why do things have to be verses <laughs> yeah and yeah. I was like but also like what is with the commentary yeah, on people's on body. postpartum bodies yeah like, oh my goodness we're trying to heal and we've just birthed a baby and we're leaky and milky and bloody and all these things and like what is going on in society that there even is a conversation surrounding what a postpartum body should look like. Everyone's body looks it's, different, it's will different. react different, yeah. will be different, will feel different. Everyone's birth is different. The healing is different. It's like, stop. Why, why, why is it even a conversation? I'm not sure. Also, and can I just be really clear here with everybody? Like if you, if you're pregnant for the very first time, if you've had two kids, if you have not had any kids and you're not pregnant or you don't even want to have kids, when you um, have a pregnancy and a, and a birth and then you're in postpartum with baby one, that can look so different with baby two, with baby three. Mm -hmm. Like my postpartum body um, after I had Wyatt, totally different than my postpartum body after I had Esme, completely different with my postpartum body when I had winter. Like mm -hmm. I cannot night and day. Um, all three of them were just so different. Um, and I thought that that was really fascinating because I carried each baby differently. Um, I ate similarly with each baby, but like, um, maybe you know, a some few of, more sweeties in the second. Maybe a few more sweeties in, in the second. second yeah. <laughs> a lot of donuts with Esme. <laughs> I Sorry. Say, yes. Donut I gained queen. <laughs> so much weight with Esme's birth. And I will say that, like, you know, it was a lot, it was a much more challenging pregnancy. Um, I was gaining a lot of weight. I was um, not as active. You were grieving as well. I was grieving, yeah. right? I was in a major grieving process. Everything in my body hurt. Um, but also I think like, you know, emotional pain was coming into physical pain as well. So I mm. think some of that was like probably part of it. And Anyway, my point is that like with each each birth, um, each postpartum, it's all different. And 100%. so like we spend this time being so hard on ourselves about it in the in the postpartum era. And there's like <laughs> it's funny because I I just don't feel like people understand when you're lo looking at someone and you're commenting on their body in any way, like they may not think anything about what's going on with their body. They may only be focused on what they're doing right now. I'm breastfeeding my baby, like whatever it is. And so if you're commenting on their body, now you're bringing their awareness to their body. Mm -hmm. Even if you're like, oh, wow, you look so good. Or, you oh, lost look all at the baby weight. Yeah. Oh. And then they're like, what? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just don't yeah, comment. It's resting. Yeah. And I found that article arresting. I was like, 
What? Yes, that is arresting. <laughs> and I've done that where I've been like, oh, you know, to a friend of mine who was like, she was wearing a crop top. And I've never seen her in a crop top before. And I was like, oh, wow. I know she's been like doing Peloton and running and like all this stuff. So, wow, she's really like working hard and she's, you know, showing in, in a crop top. And so I said something to her. This is a couple of years ago. And I was like, wow, you look amazing. You know, and she's like, thanks. It's stress. And I was like, oh, mm, yeah. I should never have said that. And I was like that. I'm going to be very very aware of how I comment on someone's body. Oh like I'm gosh. not going to comment on someone's body, but I'm going to be very aware of how my words like affect people because I realize in that moment where I'm saying like, oh, you look great. She's actually like, I've been really stressed and like, this is what I look like mm -hmm. because of it. And now someone's saying this looks good and this stress is good. And like, imagine what That's that so felt like to her, you know? Well, I often will comment positive things about people's bodies like I do I'm like oh my god girl you look amazing like whoa yeah. you look so look at that stomach oh wow <laughs> like I often do I'm so that person but it's yeah interesting to hear that um and I have I guess I have like done it in a way where I feel like they'll feel like inflated by it too and be like yes. oh my god thank you and generally that will be the response but sometimes it's like no, I'm like sick. I'm in a dark, I'm in, in a really unhealthy place right now. I'm really <laughs> sad. I'm really depressed. And you're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Exactly. Um, anyway. I mean, I think that there's like a fine line there somewhere where, you know, if it's like your bestie and you guys are, this is like part of your thing and you know each, I didn't know this person super well. So yeah, I just knew that this was it like came what she out. You're like, whoa, she looks so good. Yeah. And um, it's just, yeah. you know, so I mean, I get it. Like we make mistakes in the things that we say, but that was just a moment I thought, okay, I'm bringing awareness to the fact that like in this moment, that was that, that now I realize like what that could mean for some mm -hmm. people and I'm not going to do that. So I, when I went from one to two, I had a similar experience as Teresa. I was feeling really guilty. Um, I, you know, didn't expect to have those feelings. I was like one of the first people in my circle to have kids. And so, you know, I was, feeling overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, like why it has been my world. And now I'm bringing this new baby. And I, I knew that this new baby was a gift, but I was like also experiencing so much grief in my life too. So it was a lot. And when the time came, Eric was, um, he was amazing. He would like, he was like, okay, I'm going to take Wyatt out on an adventure and you and Esme can have this time at home, you know, and like, and so then he was doing all these like activities and things with Wyatt. And then I was like, I think that's not what I, I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm feeling like you guys are leaving me a lot yeah, and I need you guys to be here too. And so I just said like, you know, what I needed in that moment. And he was like, of course, you know, and he was so showed up for, me and like, you know, he would go to work or he would go and do whatever our errands and stuff. But, you know, and him and Wyatt would go on little short trips. But like, I also really needed them to be there because I started to feel like, oh, no, does this mean my connection is slipping with Wyatt? Like now my bond, my connection are like we're everything with each other. And now is this like slipping away? And no, it's it's different. It just is. It's different after the new baby comes into the world. But as different as that is, I did consistently remember and keep saying to Wyatt and to myself, because a lot of times it's about us and like, what is it that, you know, it, like it may not be our child that's like feeling left out. It might just be that we're feeling, you know, yeah. that we're leaving them out. It's like, ah, in that moment. So, but in there, I would say that like, you know, this baby, this new baby, this new sister is like the greatest gift um, for my son because mm -hmm. he's going to have a built-in playmate. He's going to have this like amazing human that he's always connected with no matter what happens in life. And I saw that even more during the time because I had just lost my dad. And so my brother and I were so connected and talking through all these things and my mom and like, I just loved the feeling of our family unit. Mm. And, you know, as the older sibling, I handled so much of what was happening in the home when, you know, my dad was dying and all of that. But, um, 
but my brother and I would just constantly talking through everything. And it's amazing to think like, okay, I've given him this gift of this baby, but I'm thinking about all this stuff. It's postpartum. It's like a couple of weeks. I'm thinking about all these things. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like a basket case of crying yeah. um, and feeling guilt and all these things. And I would say that that definitely changed with baby number three. So with baby number three, we did the first 40 days. We stayed at home um, a lot and the kids were in and out. Like Eric would take them to go do things and then they would come back and, you know, they were in school and like there was just uh, a lot. They were doing like Zoom school and stuff because it was 2020. But there was a lot of like um, time at home where we were together. And some of my favorite memories from postpartum uh, with winter is that we had a lot of meals um, in my bedroom on the floor. We would like lay I towels around and we would have and people were like sending food. You know, my manager sent over this like amazing Italian meal one night and I just remember Eric bringing it into the bedroom. I was so excited because he, you know, came home from work and like um, we laid out all the plates and we uh, sat around together in the bedroom on the floor and we ate and the newborn babies like laying on the bed. And so it was just like the sweetest thing ever. And so I think one, one piece of advice I would have would be that go easy on yourself, take things slow Um, understand that the guilt could be there, but like also recognize that like what you're doing is so beautiful and your child is only going to blossom and grow from it. And it's okay for your child to struggle. It's okay for you to struggle, Mm -hmm. struggle. There's growth there. Um, And then they may have big feelings too. They'll have big feelings. Yeah. Wyatt had, Wyatt, I felt like the moment the baby came home, Wyatt was like this gentle sweet child and it, like all of a sudden we in- injected like you know it was like we put gave him like kool-aid or something he was just like <laughs> jumping on the bed and he was like bouncing off the walls it was all look the stuff at me look like, at me yes and i was like what is this energy like did i not notice it before is it new like am i only noticing it because i'm in a very like calmed place right now like but it was definitely this just like shift where he was like, wait, 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 I'm here too, you know? And mm-hmm. so there was a lot of that dynamic and it happened for you know, a couple of weeks and then it was back to normal. So, um, but anyway, so then I think that kind of takes us into sleeping arrangements, right? Yeah. And I was going to say, um, the, if any jealousy comes up at all, um, it also depends, it really depends on, I think, age gaps too. Like if you have yes. really small age gaps, it's the, the child's almost not going to know. They're going to be like, oh, there's this new thing here to play with. But if they don't have their words yet, it maybe that transition is going to be easier in terms of jealousy. Maybe not. Maybe the frustrations will be even bigger because they don't understand what's happened and why things are different. Um, for me, I felt like, all my kids are around two and a half years apart, like two years, four months apart, two of them. And then the other gap is two years, nine months apart. So we were able to really prep the kids for the new baby coming. And that one to two gap, as I said, that one to two transition was probably the most challenging because it went from that one-on-one thing where it was like just me and my guy all the time everywhere adventuring (laughs) like woo it was just me and him and all of a sudden you're like who do I tend to first and I do want to say there's there's this great piece of information and advice that I've heard over the years which is um the if the baby can wait a beat (laughs) like if they're safe yes if if they're safe if the two are crying if both yes. are crying at the same time or both need you at the same time, if the baby's safe in a safe place. Yes, in a yeah. safe place, you can tend to the older one, meet the need. And what I used to do was I, I would go meet the need and I would bring him yes. to Forrest and we could meet Forrest's need together. Yeah. And again, like giving that sense of responsibility. So I found that that would really help dissipate any like mom feelings. Like, where's my mom gone? Why is my mom yes. not helping me? And you're and not I, telling I them like, that. wait, wait, wait. I have to help the baby. Wait, wait, exactly. wait. Exactly. Oh, no, you're not no, giving- no. Not you saying, yeah. no, don't. Gentle. No, no. Yeah. And you're not like putting them on pause you're like oh my gosh yes how can I help you can you want to come and help me like help me with the baby what should do we do this together needs? what do you yeah, think what she do you needs? think exactly yeah. which is so nice and you know if you you can even like 
rewind that to um, when you're pregnant and you have a baby, you know, if you have one kid or two kids at home, but make them a part of it by you can take them with you to the doctor to do scans. You can talk to them about it. Like you can bring them the ultrasound photo. You can um, ask them like, what games do you want to play with your baby when your baby's here? And like all those things. And let them and pick out gifts for the let baby. Let them pick out a gift for the baby. And just make sure that when you're talking about baby, you're saying your baby. This exactly. is your baby. Your mm-hmm. sibling, your baby. Like, you know, this is for all of us. Like, make sure it's not just like, well, my baby or make sure it's our yeah. baby. So that they understand that they're a part of that. And then and then yes, the the advice that you gave about when baby arrives, having a, a present <laughs> or something, yeah. some kind of gift. They've made something, whatever it is, like something that you're bringing home from the hospital, if it's hospital or something that you have there that like, look, the baby, you know, told me that this is what they wanted you to have or like whatever it is. And the baby brought this for you. And I I kept being like, the baby brought this little red boat for you, like somehow (laughs) out of my belly. (laughs) Yeah. Somehow. Somehow. Just came out holding the boat. Yeah. And (laughs) why it was stoked about Uh, this boat. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, And I will say like now I have so many children um, and we do the same thing over it, no matter how old they are. You know, Bodhi was seven when I gave birth to my fourth baby. Mm. And like with each baby, you still keep that same narrative. Like this is your gift, your sibling, your baby. How do yes. you want to help your baby? And I have not had any issues with jealousy stuff. Although if I ever see it, like there was recently I noticed – I would say six months ago with poet that she was doing a lot more baby voice. And um, I was like, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder where it's coming from. I think it's because she's worried that her milk time, her nursing time with mom is coming to an end and then Prairie still gets to continue having nurses. And I, um, you know, tandem nursed and breastfed the whole way through so they were all sort of um were nursing together and then move well not all of them but I would have I would wean oh, each five other kids. oh god no in line. I see the daily mail heading right now um everybody um, just like okay oldest last uh, youngest oh first line up yeah I could not do that but um no they all finished around like uh, age three three and a half but so I feel like that really helped us but now we have this thing where um if someone I I really look at each child in the family I'm like all right who needs some more like massaging in meaning emotional massaging like yes who needs that in the family like and Forrest by the way never needs it because he's no. Mr. Independent oh my gosh dude. his regulation he's just like walks he, away he and just like own. emotionally regulates yeah. his but Bye. that makes me feel like I want to give it to him more. Like I, I or, I'm always like, oh, I'm going to take Forrest with me on, on the shopping yeah. trip. But I, we always, Mark and I always will like pick a kid who we feel like needs it in the moment to like take out on a solo trip. So like yeah. Mark will take Bodhi the other day, Mark took Bodhi to Whole Foods and I took Forrest to go and get some art supplies and then Oh, hi, Forrest. (laughs) He just popped in. And then um, Poet, I'll be like, all right, Poet and I, we're going to just have one-on-one time in the pool together. So it's always this dance between your your children and the fact that they're siblings and there's, in my situation, there's a bunch of them. So you want to make them feel seen and heard and loved and as as individual members of the family. Hello, my darling Bodhi standing right there. What do we need? Come here. Um, so um, I need help getting onto the Zoom link. Oh, onto the Zoom link. Okay, do you want to bring it here? We're doing Zoom school, guys. Do you want to bring it here and I can get you on? Okay. All right, come on. Okay, I'm going to read this right now and then I'll jump into the um, the beds. Um, right. Okay, so... Um, 
let's see. I Sybil writes, hi, I was hoping that you could do an episode of how to make transition easier for one to two children. I have a 26 month old boy and I'm expecting another baby in September. And I love my dear son so much. And we have a close relationship and we cuddle to sleep. Um, although the pregnancy was planned straight away, I'm panicking about how my son will react and how it will affect our relationship. Since you guys have made this transition, can you give me some tips on how to move my toddler into his own room. That mm-hmm. would be great. And so okay. I think that's like the perfect transition. Thank you, Sybil, um, yeah. to the next topic, which is like, you know, if you're transitioning from co-sleeping, now what? You know? And yeah. so it was so different for me with every kid, like, you know, Wyatt, he was, I started off co-sleeping with him, but he's like a he's like a helicopter in the bed, you know? So like he <laughs> was amazing and I love breastfeeding him to sleep. And I was like, co-sleeping is my thing, you know? And it was like so about me. And I really wanted that. But he is a heater and he is a helicopter. And he was like just some nights we would wake up and his head would be at the foot of the bed and his legs would be in the middle somewhere. And I was just like, okay, this is not working. Yeah. And so I was like, what's the next step? And so then I was like, okay, I'm going to start. I had started already doing naps with him in the crib, like putting him down in the crib for a nap. And then we transitioned to, um, okay, now I'm going to start trying to like put him down in the crib at night to sleep. And there was this amazing doula who I reached out to. She was like a sleep, you know, specialist doula. And I just called her and I said, this is the this is what we've been doing with sleep, which is like naps in the crib. Um, I was like, I do have like a monitor in his room. It's like a video monitor. And I was like, so I did naps in the crib, but he would sleep in my room, but like he's not sleeping well. So I know he needs to be in his, you know, space, which is like right down from my room. And so um, she said, here's what you do. And this was specific to me because of our, like how we had been doing it. Mm -hmm. So if it sounds similar, you could always try it um, if that's like how you've been doing it. So I would lay him down in bed at night. And I would say, okay, you know, this is, you're going to go night night. I'm going to sing you songs and we're going to go to sleep. So he would fall asleep pretty good on his own. Um, and then he would wake up at like midnight. Mm-hmm. And so I told her like he wakes up and he starts yelling for me. So she said what to do over the monitor was to say the same thing every time. Night night, little bear. Night night. It's sleepy time. I love you. Go to sleep. Lay down. And so then he would like call out again, night, night, little bear, say the same thing. And so then um, weirdly, I don't know if it had to do with like exactly because she had gone through and had me talk about everything with his sleep and all the patterns and everything. Three nights of doing this um, and he was, that was it. He slept in his own room, (gasps) which is nuts. And how old was he? He was like, I think at this time he was like three or four. No, yeah, no, three. No, no, no. He wasn't four. He was, nope, that's not true because Esme arrived when he was three. So he was about two at this time because I was still co-sleeping with him. I was trying to do like a pack and play. I'd just been shooting a movie and we, that was it. We were in Atlanta. We we're shooting a movie. He was at a pack and play, but wasn't like sleeping in it all night. But I was trying to transition him out of breastfeeding and like all of that stuff too. And so finally it was when he was, um, we come back and I got pregnant. Then when he was like two, I'd stop breastfeeding him to get pregnant. And then I slowly was trying to like, how do I do this? How do I transition him? So before he was three, some, somewhere between his second and third birthday, we did this thing that the doula mm-hmm. told us to do and it totally worked. And wow. he was like sleeping in his own crib. And then, um, so that was him and that's his story. Yeah. So specific to that child. Yeah. Because the next child came along, Esme, and she was an amazing co-sleeper. Like champion co-sleeper, nurses on the side of the boob, sleeps through the night. Like she did, you know, multiple times in the night she wants to nurse, but falls right back asleep. Yeah. Doesn't move around like and sleeps better when she's next to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, very different kids. So gauging that with your child, I think is also really important. But understanding like, yes, when you have a new baby coming into the fold, that's going to change, right? And so um, I will say that a thing that I never used with Asma, I never used a crib, never. I had a bassinet that I only used when she was like a newborn to put her down to nap in. 
And then I had a docker tot. I yes, loved same. the docker tot. If you don't know what that is, there's also um, another version. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's organic. Swaddle me organic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Swaddle me organic. So those are so awesome is for that- um, you can co-sleep and have them in that or you can put it on the ground or on a you know mattress on the floor, whatever it is. Um, but like all of Esme's naps were in the docketot. And then I also had it in the bed mm-hmm. and would like nurse her in the docketot and then lay next to it. And it was so comfortable. It's she- so great. It was great. So um, I used the docketot with her. And then once she was too big, I just laid her in the middle of the bed and she slept great as a co-sleeper. I slept with her all through my pregnancy in bed with me and then waited basically too late uh, until baby was here. I probably (laughs) should not. I should have handled this sooner. I just was holding on to those moments of like sleeping with her. And then um, I had the, the mattress on the floor um, that we were like, okay, we're going to transition to a floor bed and I'm going to lay in floor bed with you. And then I'm going to get up in my bed, but I'm right here next to you. We can hold hands, like all the things. Mm -hmm. And it was a few nights of struggle at first, like of her being like, wait, what? (laughs) And then, um, and then like, she just, totally gets it. You know, she'll still sometimes try to come up and sleep in my bed. And and she was four, right? And she was four. She yeah. was four. She was four. I probably should have done that sooner. Um, honestly, like reflecting back, Eric and I were like, what were, what was I doing? Like, you know, just, holding on I, to those moments. I and was, it was working. It was working. And she's mm. such a cuddly co-sleeper. Mm, um, so is so, Yeah. So it was so nice. But then, you know, new baby arrives and we decided to do it. So I made it a gentle transition by like laying in bed with her a little bit next to me and then getting back up into my bed. And it Mm -hmm. was, it worked out. Um, And now I have a baby in the bed. I have my six-year-old on a floor bed next to me and I have um, my son in his room on his bed. And there's a trundle. If Asme ever decides to go to the trundle, she's welcome. Mm -hmm. But she's also welcome just to stay. (laughs) But yeah. right now, Eric's on the trundle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sleep oh my pile. Goodness. Sleep anyway, pile. so I'm just saying, like, it's so different for every kid. It is. I had such a similar experience to you. I distinctly remember um, Bodhi sleeping in the middle of our bed until the baby came. And the same thing. Yes. I was like... Because with safe co-sleeping practices, they say not to have siblings in the bed with a newborn right. baby. Right, which is why, so, yeah, you feel Which like is you why you do out. have to, yeah. Um, so what we did, same thing. We called it the Montessori bed. The Montessori bed was there. And Bodhi, I would breastfeed Bodhi and newborn Forest in that little bed together. Although I will say we did start transitioning him before the baby came. So we transitioned him maybe three months before the baby came and I would lie there and our thing was we'd put on um, John Lennon, like beautiful boy, and I would sing it to him. And because I don't have a singing voice like Sarah's, I would use the backing track to help me stay in tune. (laughs) Um, And I would sing beautiful boy to like my boys. And um, it was so gorgeous. I have so many beautiful videos that the boys love watching now of like me and the two of them in the bed together singing Uh, that and like, you know, stroking their heads. And like I have always slept with the kids and I've always lied next to the kids until they fell asleep. And I would say that only changed for the older two uh, Recently, since we moved into this new house, they've now gone to bed independently without me lying next to them. And in some ways, I'm really sad because like the independent sleepers, but still so often we'll all lie in bed together. It's happened a lot recently. We'll pick someone's bed like forests and um me and poet and prairie and Bodhi and forest we're all in there together we play the music i sing the songs like we just have such a special time together everyone falls asleep and then after that mark and i will move them into their own beds um but having a sibling really helped for us to get 
the next child out of the bed. So when Poet came along, uh, Forrest was two years, four months. So three months, again, three months before Poet arrived, we had moved Bodhi into his own bedroom and Bodhi was five when Poet arrived. So Bodhi and Forrest, now two and a half year old Forrest, they slept in the same little bed together. So that's how that's we cute. ended up getting the two boys out of our bedroom because they had each other and they had bunk beds, but they wanted to sleep together on the bottom yeah. bunk. Um, and they still sleep together so often they'll have sleepovers. So like last night they decided to have a sleepover the night before they were in their own beds um, and it was so beautiful. But I will say that was the luxury of having the siblings be together Together, that they didn't feel like they didn't have that warm person to cuddle at night time. Mm-hmm. Um, and even now what we've done with our bed is we haven't been really dogmatic about it. We've said, look, this is mum and dad's bed. We only have so much space, but we can have sleepovers. So, totally. um, and when Mark's away, I will often have all Every of them in the bed kid. with me. Yeah. Same. I'll have the boys <laughs> down the bottom doing like top tail and then I'll have the girls next to me. Yeah. Um, and it's so nice. And I know that I'm headed into that in the next few weeks because um, we're leaving to go to Australia and it's just me and the kids. So I was like, oh, my gosh, we get to have our big sleep overnights, which is so fun. And here's the thing, guys, like it doesn't last forever. They no. grow up and they get bigger and then soon they're not going to want to have sleepovers in your bed. And we happen to sleep better, my husband and I, co-sleeping. For some people, yeah. the idea of having your child in your bed and nursing, and that sounds like a nightmare. For me, I slept better knowing they were right there. Um, I could nurse in sort of a sleepy state so that I wasn't totally waking up and having to put Same. the light on and walk down the hallway to the Side crib. Line. Yeah. A lot of people get very woken up having to like go down the hall, turn the light yeah. on, get the baby out of the crib. And also I just felt like, you know, every other mammal, like every other animal sleeps with their young. Like I yes. felt like I had that same maternal instinct, like, I want to sleep with my child and my child yeah. wants to sleep with me. And whenever I put my child in a different room, they weren't happy with that. They felt afraid right. and scared and alone. So when they were younger, when they were yeah. little. So we decided that co-sleeping was right for us. It's not right for everyone. And also there are very safe co-sleeping practices that we talk about in our book, The Zen Mama's Guide to Finding Your Rhythm Through Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. You can get it on Amazon or listen to the audiobook. Audiobook. Um, <laughs> and we talk about co-sleeping um, safe yes. practices. But there are there are so much more to dive into in this topic there's just so many different ways of doing things and things we've learned that maybe we need a second episode but if you're really desperate and you want to know more about sleeping and co-sleeping pick up our book or listen to the audio book because we get into all of our different examples yeah. like in such depth so uh, because yeah. because there's so many different ways to do it and um and just like with my story with Wyatt like there's some kids that really just don't like I wanted to co-sleep it was me and Wyatt just was not the baby that that was not how he wanted to sleep he was but just you did like, it for two and a half years Sort right? of like yeah. I swaddled him and put him in a bassinet for a while. I tried so many different things with him because yes. it just wasn't like a natural fit yeah. to sideline and sleep with him. So I was trying like a lot of st- all the sleep sacks and all the things like yes. there's so much more that I could go into with that if we really broke it down. But um, point being that like, yeah, he was in the bed. He was on a bed next to my bed. He mm-hmm. was in his crib um you know he was in a pack and play for a while we tried to pack and play next to the bed like I didn't think about the mattress next to the bed until later on yeah so he, we did the pack and play um but anyway like that there were so many steps with his that like w- once I figured that out when I got to the next kid it was just sort of like okay I'm gonna see what she needs or what she mm-hmm. likes and then we're just gonna go from there and because once he was actually sleeping in his crib he was sleeping through the night 
super happy heaven like, that heaven that's what he needed he gets really really hot yeah so my body heat overheated him and would wake him up yeah um, and if you got so, airing next to you too it's like just so hot yeah it so and hot. i swaddled him in this like little swaddle blanket forever and he was a huge baby and like, like was busting mm-hmm. out of it always busting my <laughs> husband runs so hot as well and it's so we're constantly mine, uh, in in fights i'm like Mark, because he puts this fan, this crazy fan, like yes. it's so loud and, and it's so freezing. cold. <laughs> and we've got a fireplace in our room and I'm like, I always have the fireplace going. And then he's like, yes. okay. So then he'll open the windows in the middle of winter. Yeah. So I, yeah. I was like, cool. If you're going to open the windows and have the fan, I have the fireplace on. That's right. So <laughs> this, this is us the other night. I was like, it was all like counteractive oh to each other. But uh, um, before we go, I want to say the last, yes. the my last, last flow that I found with the last two babies in case there are co-sleeping curious people out there but also snoo curious folks um I love the snoo because it's right next to the bed it has the movement I never um had issues with transitioning them out of the snoo because my babies would start the night in the snoo they would often sleep for eight hours in that thing and then I would bring them into the bed because obviously the kids go down at like 7.30. So eight hours later is still the middle of the night. So I would bring them into the bed and I would have the docker tot as our co-sleeper in between Mark and I. So they would go between the snoo and the docker tot during the night. And that was the most rest I ever got was once the snoo yes. was introduced. And that was when Forrest was a little guy, we first started using the snoo. So the combination of the docker tot and the snoo was just like my heaven situation. Yeah. And the cool <laughs> thing about the docker tot is it has like a pillowy edge. It's like a safe pillowy edge. But um, so you, you can rest your head on there when you're breastfeeding and it's really yeah. comfortable. It's so comfortable. I know. And I would sometimes just fall asleep with my head on the little like pillow edge I there. Know. Like just with the little baby's breath on my face. I remember just like the little newborn smells. Oh, oh it's so delicious. It's yes. so delicious. It's so I amazing. love it. You guys, thank you for asking these questions in our DMs. Um, most of the questions, I didn't read off all of them because most of them were asking the same thing which was just like co-sleeping and transitioning and all of that so we will get to so many more of your questions I do think that there's another version of this that we will do and then in the meantime um, check out our book The Zen Mama's Guide to Finding Your Rhythm in Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond and thank you guys so much for joining us Daisies you can find us on Apple Podcasts Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts thanks guys bye, bye.